Hi, I'm Brent Hayden, Olympic medalist and world champion and co-founder of Ask Athletica. Today on this show, we're gonna talk about Olympic medal winning mindsets that you can use in your business and daily life. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty Interview Series. I'm your host, Dolph Barron, founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything. Let me ask you, are you committed to up-leveling your leadership? Well, today we're looking to Olympian-style discipline. Could there be a downside when it's applied to business? Well, stay tuned to find out. Remember, you can now chat about this episode or any past episode on our Facebook page. Simply go into Facebook and look for Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. If you're a new listener, new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. As always, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever it is you tune into podcasts. And we always need your help in staying relevant. So please get over there to wherever you tune in rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And you can also catch us on traditional radio stations across the United States every Monday and Thursday, all the way from Florida to Colorado, and even in Washington, D.C. now. You can also track us down on Roku TV, where there's over 100,000 subscribers. And if you are a regular listener, regular viewer, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners with a potential reach of 2.5 to 4 million listeners for every single show. We're honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better, a better leader. And you can also listen to us on Spotify or Google Home or Alexa by simply saying, play Dog Baron Podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. As a leader, whether you are a CEO or someone in the C-suite, a sales leader, an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, or leader in any capacity, you know that whether we like it or not, in one form or another, being disciplined is a part of what makes us great leaders. But is there a downside to it? And if there is, how do you sort out where it's needed and where it's not needed? Well, let's find out. My guest on this episode is Brent Hayden. Now, Brent Hayden is a, uh, a three-time Olympian, Olympic bronze medalist, world champion swimmer from British Columbia, right where I am, from Mission, BC. Mission, a bit tricky, but BC. There are other famous people from there. He's regarded as the fastest swimmer in Canadian history and was one of the first Canadian swimmers to ever win an Olympic medal in the most coveted event, which is the 100 meters freestyle. He is a BC Hall of Fame uh, inductee, Queen Diamond Jubilee medalist recipient, a two-time TEDx speaker, as well as a contemporary fine arts photographer whose work is gaining traction in galleries worldwide. Please help me welcome three-time Olympian, Olympic medalist and world champion, co-founder of Astra Athletica, superior functional active wear, Mr. Brent Hayden! <laughs> Thanks, Tom. That was amazing. <laughs> it's good to have you here, mate. Thanks for joining us. Um, you've managed to escape from Mission BC all the way to New West. You're in the right direction as you head downtown. <laughs> well, I, I moved from Mission back in 2001. I was, so I've actually lived in Vancouver for 17 years. And my wife and I moved out to New West just, uh, just a couple of years ago. And now we're going through another move right now. Um, not, a, not a permanent move, more like a leave of absence. We're actually going to be heading over to Beirut 
So going in completely opposite direction and uh, we'll be spending some time over there and splitting our homes between the two places. That's pretty awesome. Um, and we, I'll come into why you're going to Beirut in a bit because that's that in and of itself is a fascinating thing. You and I talked a little bit about it uh, when we had coffee and uh, I think it's a pretty interesting subject for people to know about. But before we jump in, uh, one of the subjects I like to, to, to ask, um, who is someone who we likely wouldn't know who's had a major influence on your life? You know, all leaders are impacted and influenced by other people. And sometimes it's people nobody's even heard of. Who's yours? I had a number of people throughout my career. Um, I'd have to say it was my first one would have been my last summer club swimming coach, Phil. He, uh, he kind of was the guy who took me from being this sort of weird, awkward swimmer, didn't really have a lot of talent, had a lot of drive, but not a lot of talent and actually turned me into somebody who could actually uh, have potential. So he was able to do that in just, just two years time. And then, you know, went on and, you know, joined a club out in Chilliwack with Vince, who took me from summer club swimmer to now the universities are, are looking at me, but yeah. What it, was it about Phil though? So I, I, I think that so often it's something small, you know, that, is missed by many, but then it's, it's a nugget for others. Yeah. I, I think Phil didn't put any limitations on what I could do. Mm. Right. I feel like a lot of people think, you know, oh, it's all, you know, potential is just like this level and everybody's got their potential. They can only get up to that part. When you take away that potential uh, level and just say like, let's just see how far they can actually go. Right. What's the best version of themselves that they can, that they can create then there's no limit. That's why, um, you know, one of my favorite quotes is some people shoot for the stars, but personally, I don't like to set limits because you can't accurately gauge your potential until you actually get there. That's very true. Well, in that context, tell us how someone who failed swimming lessons became Canada's fastest swimmer. Cause that in and of itself was like, yeah, um, yeah, I, I feel at that point was pretty sad. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I had I had very little potential in just about everything that I did. People did not look at me as somebody that could potentially be uh, one of Canada's greatest athletes. I was well, let's face it, you were from oh. Mission. <laughs> you know, Missions produced quite a few. Uh, few <laughs> people. Let me let me tell you, famous pop star. What's the name? Uh, Carly Rae Jepsen. She's uh, she's in my yearbook. Um, <laughs> Back in uh, it was the Montreal Olympics, we had an Olympic silver medalist in swimming um, as well, Gary McDonald. And then we had Ryan Lauren, who was from Mission, uh, was the Canadian record holder for the 50 meter freestyle. So I actually, when I was little, I would actually um, I'd leave my parents. My parents would have to come and find me, and they'd always find me in the Hall of Fame as we we're leaving the pool because I'd just be in there just reading the stories of these other athletes from Mission and started realizing, like, or start dreaming about well, why, why can't that be me why can't I create my own story and I did not think about you know the other kids that were that were beating me you know how many times I was getting in trouble for not listening in swim practice and I started just to kind of start to believe and imagine and have these wild dreams that other people would have thought were way too impossible but you know it's just that, that was just me I just wanted to just get inspired and just believe that anything was possible very cool so, so how did you go from being somebody who was failing in swim lessons to the, to the fastest swimmer? What, what, what do you think was the, the catalyst for that? I mean, you know, you yeah. failed swim lessons. Yeah, I stopped focusing on the results. I focused more on the performance. Um, you know, again, not being the best kid on the team, I was regularly getting passed by the faster kids. Um, you know, and sometimes when my coach would put me in the lanes with the, with the older swimmers, they grab your feet as they, as they swim by and they, you know, they pull you back and water goes shooting up your nose. And so I would start to find ways um, other than my own personal fitness levels that I could stay ahead of them. So they couldn't, couldn't pass me again. So I'd focus on the techniques. I'd focus on, you know, making sure I'm getting tight streamlines, you know, good flip turns, uh, not breathing out the first strokes, right? All those little disciplinary um, things with technique that, every great swimmer needs to be able to develop and you know when the other swimmers would beat me and you know i would i would lose i would not get discouraged with my result i would look at my performance and say well you know what i might not have won but i did the best time today or i only took this number of breaths in in this race so that's an improvement 
And when I started oh. focusing on those little things, then the results started to take care of themselves. And then I started becoming the runner up in the swimmies. Then I started winning the aggregates and then I started breaking the meet records and it just sort of kept transitioning uh, that way. That is, that is fascinating that you, you know, because I think that we would assume it was all about the results, you know, and, and you actually went, no, no, it's about someone else. It, is that something, I mean, I, I guess my question is, what's the most common misunderstanding about being an Olympian? Because I think that we've got these images in our head, we've got these stories in our head, but I think that oftentimes with anything where we get a story in our head, it's, it's a misrepresentation. So what is the most common misunderstanding about being an Olympian, do you think? I, I think we're people think that every Olympian and I know other Olympians will, they'll, you know, they'll be different. That's why I just want to say every Olympian, the common misconception is that every Olympian is results driven, right? right. The, the truth is we are performance driven. That's fascinating. Right? right. Cause if you take care of everything you can do, for example, in swimming, nobody else is in my lane. When during, when the gun goes, that's my lane. Nobody else can control what I do there. I am, I'm 100% responsible for the, everything that happens between the two walls and between the two lane rows from the time the gun goes off. So if I can take care of that and do my own performance, the results take care of themselves. You always have that thought though of winning. That's always in the back of your mind, but cool. that's not the focus. So how do you, because I mean, something like the Olympics, of course, but in life, we are driven by results. We, we live in the results driven world. How do you, how did you develop that Olympian mindset that took you out of the results and into the performance? Because as you said, everything is going to be, you know, did I win? Did I win? How did you, how do you get there? I think I got there because I sucked for a lot of years. <laughs> Like, God honest truth, I sucked. Um, learning how to lose was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Um, being as somebody who wasn't naturally gifted with, with talent was one of the best things that ever happened to me. There are so many swimmers along the way who had talent that people thought, oh, that's the one that's going to succeed. They're, you know, they're winning all the races, they're breaking all the new records, they're going to go to the Olympics, and they're going to have all the success and then there's the rest of us that are kind of we're over here we're kind of in this little pool of you know as eh, they're not really they don't really have the the it factor they don't have the you know they don't have the the x factor mm -hmm. thing but those are the ones that most likely are going to make it to the olympics i've spoken to many olympians about this because you know i always just kind of assumed that while I was going through this, that I was somehow unique in this way that all these other Olympians have talent. And I'm kind of the one breaking the mold. And the more I talked to them, I realized that, you know, I actually was the mold. Um, right. There's, um, you know, hearing stories of Olympians who regularly get cut from school teams all the time. Yeah. Right. Um, Michael Jordan, not making on the basketball team. It's the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, the challenges and the failures are greater teachers than the successes ever are. Success is, you know, it's reward. It's, oh, it's great. I'm, I, I'm amazing. You don't learn anything in that. No. You learned you've already, you've already mastered that thing or that you're just better than everybody else. But when you lose, you know, there's so many lessons you can learn there. And that's where your, your superpower comes from. How do you from. stop yourself from going down the I failed uh, or the, uh, I'll just quit mode. I mean, cause that, you know, that's a natural, natural mindset. It's not, it's not unique to anybody. Everybody has it, you know, things go south and it's natural. It's easy to go up, ah, screw it, throw your hands in the air and yeah. walk away. How do you, how did you get up when you'd been knocked down? How do you get up off the canvas when you've been knocked to the canvas 18, 20 times, not once or twice, you know? It's, it's, um, I would say there's a few things that have to happen. One, um, you have to be driven, not motivated, right? Because right. motivation is crap. Absolutely. Um, like I get asked that question all the time. How do you, how do you stay motivated? And I actually have a, um, developed a theory that I call, I call it the match theory. If you light a match, you know, it's not going to keep you warm through the night, but if you actually put it to 
something like put it to kindling or something other, some other kind of fuel then becomes a fire and then it's going to take you through there. So motivation is kind of, it's like so much potential in the thing, but unless you actually put it to something, it's not going to save you through the night. So motivation is very much um, like that. But also, too, so when you, yeah, so when those downsides come, you know, it's like that rainstorm, but the fire is big enough, you're still going to be able to weather it. But there are those times where, you know, you wonder, like, how am I going to get through this? And the best, yeah. thing, best thing you can do is talk to someone, right? I, Tell us about that. See, after the, the 2004 Olympics, um, that, that was a huge, huge down point in my career because... Um, I felt like I let my team down in the, in the relay. Um, my split alone was, was more than the difference needed to make up to get onto the podium. And I felt like I had not just let my four teammates down. I let my coach down who trained me to get there. And, um, and ultimately I felt like I let my country down. And then the night before the closing ceremonies, I was out trying to kind of um, sort of party away the pain, right? I was trying to forget everything and kind of went on this sort of, uh, you know, this, you, I guess, you, you know, someone say called partying, you call it like path of destruction, self-destruction or whatever. But I ended up finding myself in a place I didn't want to be at. And I ended up um, at a place right when a riot broke out and I was targeted by the police because they thought I was a rioter. Um, turned out it was just because I was tall and wearing a dark shirt. But I was face down on the streets, um, getting bloodied and kicked and um, beaten with batons by about five or six riot police officers. And then I got arrested and I was in handcuffs for about an hour before they released me and said, yeah, sorry, you were tall and wearing a dark shirt. But just let me stop you there for a minute, because I, I, I don't want to skip over this because this is important. So, yeah. you know, being at the Olympics, being an Olympian, there's a good deal of celebrity to that. There's a good deal of, wow, you know, and, and justifiably, you know, yeah. there's a lot of, a lot of hard work in getting there. And then, you know, you get, you fail, you, you fail to meet your own expectations. And with that comes pain. That's what we were just talking about. With that comes pain that pain you either sit with you move through you do something about or you distract yourself you chose to distract yourself you went out with with whoever it was you did some partying and as you come out you you walk into a riot yeah and the police assume you're part of that riot and the next thing you know are you drunk or or you know are you so yeah we yeah, no, we had been drinking. It was it was, it was about two or three in the morning. So two or three in the morning, and you're face down in the street, handcuffed, being beaten by the police because they think you're a yeah you know, you're a, a member of this a street revolution. Yeah, are you done at the Olympics, or do you have to still compete? Oh, this was a week after I was done competing. So a week after, so you're just hang, hanging out, and and. So of course the cops don't know anything and, and you're down. What is that? Tell us about that moment. I mean, you know, I know that you had, you'd had a couple of bevies, but is there a moment of lucidity there of like, Oh my God. Cause you felt like you'd let down the team. Yeah. But now this is a, you know, do you think, you know, Oh my God, if the press find out that an Olympian, a, a Canadian Olympian is, you know, part of this riot and has been arrested. Are you afraid of that too? No, I wasn't even thinking about that because uh, ultimately um, I didn't do anything wrong. I essentially, we walked out and we're just kind of standing there and we saw this lineup of police and we're kind of going, well, why are they all standing there? You know, they're shield to shield and uh, with their, you know, ride gear on and we're, we're all kind of looking around and then they just started like running at us. So we just ran in the other direction just to get out of there. And so, and I just ran it through a doorway and I stopped because I was out of the street. So I didn't want, I just didn't want to be in the street, but they ran inside and grabbed me and pulled me back out. Um, but I was like, you know, I, I didn't actually do anything wrong. So I wasn't really worried um, about that. What I was thinking about was this was my big dream. Right? right. As early, the first time I can probably remember actually saying this dream out loud was grade three when our teacher made us stand up in front of each, um, in front of the class and proclaim what we wanted to be when we grew up. And I actually said I wanted to swim in the Olympics. So I was thinking grade about three. grade three, back when I sucked. And Fantastic. I was just, 
And that's when, that's what I was thinking about that. This was that dream I had been dreaming of my entire life. And here I am. This is the worst moment of my entire life. How, mm. Like how did my biggest dream become like the worst moment of my entire life? Yeah. That's, that's what I was thinking about as well as, you know, I'm trying to protect my head at the same time. And sure. they, they cracked my elbow um, while my, with the, of the arm that was protecting my head. I couldn't move my arm for, uh, for a few weeks after that. Um, had to pull out of the world short course championships because I was too injured to swim. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that's, I, I still often wonder like how, like how does somebody else actually go through that? Because I almost didn't come out of that. Right. I, when I came back to Vancouver, I could not foresee how I was going to be able to make it to the, you know, the next summer, the end of the season at the world championships. I was just like, I couldn't even see my career beyond just making it to the next practice. It was That's just what I was going to ask you. What, what was the impact of that? Because, you know, this moment of really seemingly random moment potentially could remove your entire trajectory of what you're, what you're aiming for in your life. Um, how do you, you know, how do you, and you've got an injury in the process. How do you, how did you get yourself back on track? It took time. Mm -hmm. um, I had to talk to people. I got on a regular, um, I had to do regular check-ins with my coach. Every, every practice, I had to pop my head into his office just to, one, let him know I was actually there um, and just kind of let him know how I was doing. Uh, I got set up on um, a weekly uh, schedule with, our, with my team psychologist. Sometimes we even did bi biweekly or sometimes even twice a week. Right. Um, as much as basically as much as needed, but at least once a week just to just to check in. And I was on the call on the phone with just about anybody that was willing to listen. So, you know, talking to my parents a lot, um, you know, some good friends, um, just anybody that I could just just talk to. But when I showed up to the pool, I couldn't wait to get into the water. Right. But it was for the completely wrong reason because I figured if I could just make it into the water, then no one's going to be able to see my tears. And it just, the worst part, the worst one was when I was about halfway down the pool and I just started choking on the water because um, I, I just was having flashbacks and I just, I just couldn't breathe anymore. Wow. And so I actually had to grab onto the lane rope and pull myself to the end of the pool and actually climb out to catch my breath because I just started choking on the water. But, so you had full full anxiety attack, yeah. And and you competed in major levels after that. Yeah, I think you uh, managed to come back and do that. Yeah, because by talking to um, talking to everyone, I started to realize that you know this didn't have to be the end of my book. This could have been a catalyst for something that was going to launch me into something greater, and I was able to start almost using it as fuel to move me forward. Because now people had this perception of me that was different than my own self-perception and i wanted people to see who i believed i was and within a year of being able to take that incident and actually turn it around and create a positive and create a fuel from it went to the world championships which were held in montreal so home soil and i actually helped canada's relays to two silver medals That's and amazing. i and fourth in the 200 free i actually just got out touched um, you know, and that's, that success came, you know, I was probably nine months, eight months away from wanting to quit. That's insane. That's, I mean, you get, you and I were talking and, and just so everybody understands that uh, Brent and I live in, in the, in the same general city area, um, greater Vancouver. And so we actually met and had a cup of coffee and we sat and we had a great chat. And one of the things you shared with me while we were talking was, um, how long a race is versus how much work time goes into it. Just share that. Cause I think, I think that that, that statistic alone is a real slap in the head for people, you know, especially for, for, for those people who I'm not one of them, but who are, uh, what, what do you call them? Couch athletes, you know, who, yeah. who's sitting on the couch going, Oh, you loser. They're <laughs> like, yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe you want to see what it really takes. Just go through that for a minute. Cause okay. I just want everybody address that. So for, in order for me to swim the 100 meters in the London 100 Olympics, meters. 100 meters at the London Olympics, 
I had to swim 2.5 million meters in just that season. Just say that again. I want everybody to really get that. That was like, don't, let's not, let's grasp that. <laughs> yeah. In one season. One, one season. season. Now, I was on the national team for 10 years. Right. In one year, I had to swim 2.5 million meters just so I would have the opportunity. Opportunity. The chance to swim 100 at the Olympics. And how long does that, did that 100 meters take to swim? It took me 47.8 seconds. 47.8 seconds, and you swam millions of meters to get that. That yeah. is, I mean... That and, is a great metaphor for like, you gotta be consistent. Yeah. And most days, um, you know, we were training up to five, sometimes six hours a day. You know, two hours in the water in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, plus all the, the dry land, the weight training, the chiropractic, the massage, the, the physio. Um, yeah, there's a lot that, that goes into that. Not to mention all the, you know, the sports psychology sessions that you do as well. Yeah, that's wild. You know, in the grand scheme of things, though, I mean, obviously, you, you know, we can see you're not, you're not an old fella. So in the grand scheme of things, being an Olympian really has a short lifespan. You know, I spent some time working with pro athletes who often have a really hard time with transitioning. Talk to us about your transitioning and maybe even the, the transitional identity away from just being... Brent Hayden, the swimmer, which I'm sure you're still highly recognized as, but beyond that. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I was actually just at the Mel Zajac international meet at UBC yesterday. And yeah, around there, I'm still Brent Hayden, uh, the swimmer, but I think my, my transition um, started years before doing photography. I got into photography in, in high school, taking, taking courses. And it was something that I used throughout my career as um, you know, you can call it, call it like um, a s meditation, right? Sure. I, I would use it to kind of um, escape and take my mind off of swimming, just losing myself in, in my viewfinder. And, um, you know, even develop my style. Um, my, my style became what it is because, um, you know, photography for me is about, is very meditative. And so when I retired, I still kind of had this other persona this other identity that I had because to me I wasn't always Brent Hayden the swimmer I was also Brent Hayden you know the photographer the photographer so when so when I retired from swimming I wasn't in the mindset of you know who am I anymore you know I wasn't Zoolander looking <laughs> looking in the puddle and <laughs> because when I retired I, I still had this other identity that I could um I could kind of you know lean on Mm -hmm. So that is what, one of the things that actually, uh, that actually helped me. Right. Now, in our conversation, you know, because obviously there's the photography side, but in our conversation, uh, we, we talked about how uh, being an Olympian actually kind of got in the way of you being an entrepreneur. Talk to us a little yeah. bit about that, because, you know, it, as you, if you're watching the show, uh, as opposed to just listening to it as a podcast, you can see that Brent is wearing a, um, a, a hat and on that hat is a logo. Um, so first of all, tell us what the logo is and then tell us about how being an Olympian actually has had its hindrances to your entrepreneurial path. Yeah. So this is the logo for Astra Athletica and it is a symbol it's a symbolization of every lesson and every challenge that I had to learn in my journey towards the Olympics from failing so many lessons and all those other things that you actually uh, already heard us talk about. Now the three stars are, are symbolic of the battles between your mind, your body and your soul because at the London Olympics, I couldn't four days for four days, two weeks before the games. I couldn't walk just two weeks before the game, spent four days thinking that I wasn't going to even get to compete because I, I can't walk. So how, how am I going to be able to, to compete? And then the day of my final, after I came back from that, my rib was out of place. So, but then again, at the Beijing Olympics, I had everything going for me. I was in my prime there. I was fit. I was swimming well. I had every reason why I should succeed. I was world champion the year before. 
and I didn't even get to swim in that final. You know, I came 12th. Even though I swam faster than what I went to win the world championship title the year before, I came 12th. So I took that, I took the battles between the mind, the body, and the soul, which is actually symbolic or was represented on my crest when I used to do karate, Ishinru karate back in my hometown of Mission and put it into the three positions of the Olympic podium, the gold, the silver, and the bronze. Because if you're going to succeed, you're not always going to have to do it on a day when everything is going right for you. You might have to perform on your worst day and you still have to do it. Now the A is actually you reaching for your stars and the stars over the A is you standing on top of the mountain and overcoming your challenges. So our slogan is rise through challenge. I, I just let me take a pause there because that, that was great stuff. That was really important. So you've unpacked a bunch of, you've all <laughs> opened a bunch of packages there, which I've got to unpack a few of them. Number one, why the hell couldn't you walk? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I had been suffering from chronic back spasms for a number of years. My first real bad spasm actually happened at the Beijing Olympic trials right after I made the team. Uh, ended up spending the night in the hospital right after I qualified for the team. Um, but I got back. I got back from that one and it didn't bother me through the games. But then after that, every single year, I, I couldn't go two to three weeks without having another spasm. Usually, usually smaller ones, they take me out of like a practice here and there. I'd have to go sit in the hot tub and stretch it out. And then I'd get back in. And, but it never, it, it never let me train the way that I wanted to, because every time I try to push myself, I'd have to take another step back. Right. So, but then when I got to our staging camp in Italy, um, I guess just from, you know, the long travel day to, to get there, you know, you know, muscles are all tightened up. Uh, I just got I just got off my bed, went to go grab something from my backpack, and I know I didn't get back up. I just, wow. I just ended up on the floor in essentially a fetal position and had to have people carry me down the room to the where the physio was and put and put me, you know, 190 pounds Brent onto this uh, this table and try to straighten me and and this is you getting ready for the Olympics in London. Yeah, it's 14 days away from the Olympics. So, I mean, I just I want everybody to sort of imagine that. Right? You're 14 days away from competing in the Olympics, and you can't even walk. You can't stand up. No. Wow. No. Um, and then, but on the fourth day, I was able to start moving. So I told myself, if I can just make it to the pool and just act as if, because the pool was actually in the same hotel complex, right? We picked this hotel right. because it had a 50-meter olympic size uh, training pool. So I, I made myself get there very slowly and I was just, I was just on the pool deck and my coach came up to me and I guess he could just, he, he could tell by my expression that something was going on in my head. So he just asked me what's going on in your head. And I said, I don't want to retire before the Olympics. <laughs> and he, he just looked at me and he just says, okay, well, why don't you? And that just set me off. I got, I got so angry at that thought because my, my coach has always been the one that, uh, that supports me. And that was the first time he ever really pushed my button like that. <laughs> Fabulous. And I blew up like I, yeah. and, but the next morning I woke up and I felt better. And I realized in that moment, I didn't, I didn't hate my coach anymore. Yeah. I was thankful for my coach because my coach, you know, he'd, I'd had the same coach for the, the, my entire international career, right? right? Tom Johnson. And so I think over those 10 years, he, he figured out that there was a button that I had and he knew exactly how to push it and he knew exactly when to push it. Yeah, he knew the he, when. <laughs> yeah. And basically what he did was he took that voice out of my head and made me actually face it. Right, because what he threw back at me was just echoing the same voices that I was having in my own head, and I just had to get, um, had to realize how unacceptable those voices were, and I had to get mad at it and release all that tension, all that stress that had been building up inside of me, like sh like shaking a champagne bottle, right, waiting for the the cork to pop up, and when I did that my back got better and I was back on the water within two days doing, you know, best training times that I've ever done in my entire life. Amazing. Amazing. What a great story. Yeah. Well, you, but then the, that on. rip, 
the morning of the 100 meter or the morning I was waking up from a 100 meter freestyle final, my rib was out of place. But I just told myself, you know what, if I can get through that, what I went through two weeks ago, right, this cannot stop me. Right? I would rather get on those blocks, give it everything that I had, knowing that that was going to be the last time I ever swam that race again, and my rib caused a spasm and end up in the, in the bottom of the pool with, the, you know, I call the world's most useless lifeguard <laughs> diving in to save a swimmer in the Olympic final. I'd rather give it everything <laughs> I had. You've all seen the meme, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I'd rather that happen because I get 100% than hold back and just try to finish the race safe. Right. Amazing. Yeah. So I knew my back might spasm in that race, but I didn't care. That's amazing. Now, and, and now you've gone on and you've created this, this, uh, clothing company. And as I said, you know, you discovered that your Olympic abilities actually got in the way of becoming an entrepreneur. Yeah. A little bit about that. Yeah. Because as, as an Olympian, you're, you're obsessed with this idea of perfection, the, the perfect race. We, we use video analysis for everything. We do everything in slow-mo. We, we draw the angles of our dive entries, our, of um, our catch, uh, body rolls. You know, we look, we look at everything from distance per stroke to velocity to stroke rate. Um, angle of your head, you know, everything you're looking for to have that perfect race to, you know, so you can basically shave off time because, you know, when you're at your best, you know, fitness wise, well, what's the other way you can get better? It's comes from perfection. That's mm -hmm. the, that's the only, that's the only thing. So when we actually were on our journey in entrepreneurship and, and launching Astro Athletica, that drive for perfection was getting in the way so many times because we had so many, like there are just so many times where we would come up with, you know, whether it was, um, you know, a design or a blog article or a, or a commercial or anything, it wasn't perfect. So we never put it out. We never did anything with it because it wasn't perfect. And then you're, you're weeks down the road and you're looking back and you're going, we haven't accomplished anything because we kept scrapping all these other things because they weren't perfect. Right. So I had to turn out that mindset and realize that, you know, um, what was there's that saying like imperfect action is better than perfect inaction. Yep. And as soon as I actually realized that then things started to, to start moving forward and we started being able to just like, just move the company forward. And then we started getting the orders in. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, one of the things you learn pretty quick is that perfect is the enemy of done. Yeah, you want to get exactly. shit done, you got to give up perfect because it's never going to be that way. And the only thing you'll ever do perfectly is retrospective. Yeah, meaning you look back and you go, Damn, that was perfect. Yeah, <laughs> no, at the time it wasn't. At the time, it's like, Oh, this is terrible. Totally. And, and the other thing too is like, you might have done something, it's like, Yeah, today that looked absolutely perfect. And then you go, You know, six months, Boy. a year, two years down the road, and you look back and you go, I thought that was perfect back then. That was garbage. Like, exactly. Look, look how good I am now. Like, look, or look how good these things are now, right? But that so that was a stepping stone. So realizing that you know it might not be perfect today, but it is a step in the right direction. Absolutely, it's 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 fascinating that we really don't have much perspective. We think we do, but we actually don't. I mean, there's so many times that I've done stuff, and I'm like, oh, that was amazing, and I, and I listen back, and I'm like, God, it was awful. <laughs> And other times I've, you know, I've done things and I've like been really upset with myself that it wasn't good enough. And I'm like, wow, that was really good. And I think I had told you that when we were met that I, uh, the person who runs my marketing department uh, sent me an article and uh, it was, you know, my article and she sent it back to me and I wrote back and I said, wow, this is really good. And she goes, I know you wrote it. And I go, I know, but I forgot that it was good. <laughs> I was like, Wow, I actually am pretty good at this. Yeah, <laughs> it's but it, that's how it is, and it, as you said, it can be the other way around. It, it's it's fascinating, and and I think that that's a really great lesson. You know that if you're going to be an Olympian, yeah, you're going to focus on your performance, and you've got to get you're working on shaving off bits and making it as perfect as you possibly can. But it, as a business person, as an entrepreneur, it really has to be about always growing, always trying to develop yourself, but at the same time, giving up this idea. And I think that that's the, the, the tightrope. How do I constantly grow and develop and at the same time, give up this idea of perfection? That's where um, I really love the, 
some, I sometimes refer to this as in terms of growth mindset, the, the most powerful word, and it's only three letters, and that's the word yet. Yet, right? absolutely. Every time you think, um, you know, I'm not good at this thing or that thing's not good enough, right? You just, every single time, you just add the word yet to the end of that sentence and realize that that's just a part of the process, right? Because there was a time I wasn't good at swimming, right? So if I said, I'm not good at swimming yet, yeah. suddenly it becomes something that's attainable, something that I can work on. It's a great, great reframe and an important one for people yeah. to grasp that yet is actually what determines it. Because that's the point where we will often um, give up when it's simply a yet. It's not a, it's not a finish line. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I'll tell you, like, I, I always had those voices in my head. People think that, oh, he must have always had, like, so, such positive thoughts in his head all the time. No, most of the time, I actually had very negative words. I, would, I always had self-doubt. Because, you know, I grew up with people doubting my abilities my entire life. And that became somewhat of a sense of, of belief in myself is, is, um, is, is this doubt. But I learned these little tricks that I could actually use to talk back to it. So every single time I had that voice saying, you're not good, like, you know, because I was known for having really terrible starts. You know, it was like, you can't win because your, your, your starts aren't good enough yet. Yet. So then I would go and keep working on that thing. Fantastic. Now, you know, I, at the beginning, when we opened up, we started talking about the fact that you are on the move again, that you are um, taking a little hiatus, going to a place that I think people in North America, um, and I mean this not as an insult, but just as a, as a fact of statement, a statement of fact, is that most people don't really wouldn't even know about this place in a real sense. And if they would, they think, why the hell is anybody going there? Um, and you are moving to Beirut. Tell yeah. us a little bit about, uh, well, first of all, tell us a little bit about why you're going to Beirut. I know the story, but it's interesting. I think it's valuable for others people yeah. to know. And um, how you, as a Western living, first world Canadian person, feel about moving to a place in the Middle East? Yeah, um, my, my wife, first, off, first of all, is Lebanese. She, she was born in Beirut. She grew up um, in and around um, Beirut. Um, but my wife was actually the first child star in the Middle East. Uh, back in uh, 19, she's going to kill me if I get the same one. It was, uh, it was either 86 or 87. <laughs> she, she sang at the Zacchino Doro Festival in, in Italy. And it's a festival that's still around today. And she was the first child from the Middle East that went there. And she actually won the, the festival. And Is that she, like the Eurovision Song Contest? Or don't you know because you're Canadian? <laughs> I don't know because I'm Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> or American, you wouldn't know if you were American either. That's okay. Go ahead. Um, I, I maybe, <laughs> maybe that's a good answer. Maybe. So um, her song was called Vola Palombella, which because um, she had to translate the song to be sung half in Italian and half in her in her um, native tongue, and that's the way the festival goes. Is the participants have to sing half Italian, half in uh, their native tongue. So it does, she doesn't speak Italian, but she had she had to learn how to sing it for uh, for the song. And when she came home, that song, especially because, you know, Lebanon was in the middle of the Civil War at the time. Yes. Um, the song translated means fly bird of peace. So it became a hymn for, for peace, especially among children. Uh, and it really picked up in, and even in Egypt where, you know, schools would play their national anthem followed by her song. Wow. So about eight months ago, or oh no, eight months ago, I'm going like three months ago. Uh, she was actually back in Egypt. Uh, she was on a, on a show that was one of the top um, shows in the Middle East. It's basically the Oprah of the, of the Middle East. And I'm sorry, I don't remember what it's called. And, you know, she sang her song again in front, with a 50-piece orchestra. Wow. And now there's this newfound, um, everyone's going, oh, my God, this, like, this is her. This is, this is our child star. And uh, she got on the cover of a huge magazine in Saudi Arabia. And now there's just, there's so much more interest for her to, to be back. And my wife is, she's never left music. Music has always been, uh, been a part of her. Right. And this is now she's, we're going back there to open up those, those opportunities. And, you know, my wife, she's supported me like crazy in, uh, 
you know, the last two years that we were of my career that we were te- when I, when I met her, I, I, I attribute so much of my medal to uh, to her support. So now I'm supporting her and going to help her chase her dreams. That's fantastic. So how um, <clears throat> you've you've started this this clothing company, this active wear company. Um, what happens to that while you're in Beirut? Does it continue or is it, what, what happens? Oh, it's continuing. Yeah, no, we, we've got plans in place to be able to still fulfill orders and it'll actually open up more opportunities for us uh, in that market as well. Mm-hmm. And we actually have really great connections with, with factories over there, like very personal connections where we can actually go and tour the factories and actually oversee everything. So we're actually going, we're actually looking forward to, to the opportunity from a manufacturing standpoint, um, you know, cause we'll be able to, you know, potentially be able to use, you know, things like Egyptian cotton, for example, in, yeah. in years, right? So. That's fantastic. Well, that, yeah. that's, that's, that's wonderful news. We are coming close to the end of our show and I, I want to get into uh, parts of our, uh, let's call it our lightning round okay Okay. so what i what do you find yourself most curious about at this time photography that never that never really leaves me i'm always trying to um learn uh you know it's it's photography is one of those things you never stop learning and just like in swimming you never you never really uh you never stop growing and i've actually now moved back i've taken a step back towards film now Started did that about eight months ago, so I've because I started in film, went digital for eighteen years. Now I've gone back to film. I actually, was just featured in uh, on Hasselblad's Facebook page and uh, their social media. Just you were. Months. I was, yeah. Bravo! Congratulations. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, Hasselblad is. We're talking serious stuff here, mate. Yeah. Hasselblad I, people. Who, if you don't know what Hasselblad is, they make what might be the most expensive camera in the world. Um, certainly right in the upper echelons of cameras. Yeah. The only, the only camera, or it's the only camera that's ever been on the moon. That was a Hasselblad. Yeah. Wow. There you go. Yeah. And it's funny because I, I grew up, I was obsessed with, um, with the space age. Apollo 13 was my favorite movie. I read the book. Uh, I know all right. the Neil Armstrong story. Uh, I haven't seen first man yet, but I will. And I grew up, I had the pictures of, you know, Neil Armstrong, I can't remember if it was Neil's or Buzz Aldrin's like boot print yes. on my wall that was taken on a Hasselblad. So it's one of those things where, you know, I may not have become an astronaut, but I still kind of got um, weird how the universe can, you still attract those. Uh, those oh yeah. It always, those always things, you always attract things. I even ended up with, uh, with the watch, the first watch worn on the moon. I'm not wearing it today, but I have a, the Omega Speedmaster moon watch because when I was a kid I said when I grew up I want to have that I want to have that watch and I actually <laughs> won it for being the Canadian male swimmer of the year in 2006. Fantastic that is awesome so you in the in this imaginary reality you are um, asked to write a single question this will be the final question on life's test what is the question? Oh man, <laughs> I wish you could edit out the time that's going to take me to think about it. Um, I can go to another the, question. I, I, think, I, think like. the, I think the the question would be, you know, what is your legacy? Mm. Right? What is it that you want people to remember about you? Very good. It's a good question. It's a good question for all of us. What makes Brent Hayden cry? Uh, sad puppy videos. <laughs> <laughs> you macho man, you. <laughs> <laughs> I I have a soft spot for it. like I, I love animals. Um, our 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 dog uh, Chewbacca. <laughs> um, he, he's a half palm half sheltie poshy. We actually rescued him from a from a kill shelter in in Korea. Um, he, we actually, our friend actually reached out on Facebook saying that this, this little puppy, he's, um, he's basically past his due date because they have such a high turnover that if they don't get adopted within a window, they're, they're terminated because they have to make room. So when, when we saw that go out, we, my wife and I, like, we don't even have, like, our lives are not set up for a dog. Like, are we, like, are we going to be able to do a dog? Right? Like, 
let alone kids. We're like, we can't even do a dog right now, but just like just Maybe a goldfish. <laughs> seeing, it. seeing his picture there and just like and just knowing they were gonna kill him, we're just like, you know what? Let's just let's just adopt this dog. And we got him, got him his um adoption, we got his shots, we got his um like everything he needed. We had a flown over uh from Korea and now he just had his fifth birthday uh earlier this year. And I even have a cat that now lives at my parents because my my wife has allergies, but I adopted him from the SPCA because nobody wanted him because he had one eye. So I've got news for you. Do not watch Sarah McLaughlin videos on my my wife actually just did a song for a sh for an animal shelter in Egypt called the um, Hope Bilotti Animal Rescue. So that was actually a big influence for for doing this song. So I have been watching that the Sarah McLaughlin, oh, unfortunately. No, but <laughs> yeah, my wife she's still working on it. They're just editing the the, the music video. For your wife, got, your wife comes home and there's Brent in the corner weeping. <laughs> Do it. What's going on, honey? Are you okay? Yeah, yeah I want Sarah McLaughlin. <laughs> that is fabulous. Thank you for sharing that with us. No problem. What makes, cry, what makes you cry laughing? Oh, my God. Uh, I guess Monty Python. Yeah. It's, my, my, my wife does not understand that humor, but uh, me and my friend... Uh, now I'm going to tell my friend Richard that he has to watch this because we've been friends since high school. And that's the one thing we always come back to together is we could spend years apart and still be able to bond over some stupid uh, Monty Python. I should say, shouldn't say stupid, I should actually say genius uh, Monty Python skit. And we'll, we'll just be in tears uh, laughing. This parrot is dead. No, it's not. It's a Norwegian blue. If it wasn't, what you, if it wasn't nailed to the perch, it'd be boom out of that cage. This rocket, this 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 pair wouldn't rock. It wouldn't room out of his cage. He had a rocket up his ass. It's yes. stone dead. It's gone. It's passed on. Like, it's no more. Polly, Polly, wakey, wakey. Yes. Oh man. The weirdness of Monty Python friends oh. around the world. What is your guilty pleasure, Brent? Uh, my guilty pleasure. Um, <laughs> um, I, my wife really loves the the Bachelor and the Bachelorette, and I have to admit I enjoy watching that show because I find the drama to be absolutely hilarious. <laughs> that definitely is a guilty pleasure. It, it it it's it's also a good excuse to open up a bottle of wine and sit down with my wife in front of the TV. <laughs> That's beautiful. What is something you've learned, preferably in the last 24 hours, but recently that's like something brand new that you've learned? I think just, um, it, it's just kind of that sort of that life journey. You know, I kind of got this analogy now where like, you know, life is like a river and sometimes, you know, everybody's moving moving with the current in one way or another some people are just lying back looking up at the sky and just going wherever the current's taken but sometimes you just got to take that oar and just be able to steer in whatever direction you want to go sometimes you even have to go back and fight against the current all right you got to make your own destination but it's that sort of false belief that moving forward is it is always in the direction you want to go it's absolutely not true sometimes you've got to be the one that actually steers the boat great insight so as we finish up, um, I would like for you to share with our audience one piece of practical advice based on what it is you've shared with us today. One piece that you just think that you would like people to really get. What would that be? This is that thing that I started doing when I was, you know, not a good athlete. And, you know, I was regularly known for the things I didn't do well more than the things I was doing well. Mm -hmm. I would just, I learned to just walk into practice and just think, what is one thing I can do better today that will make me better than yesterday? Hmm. One thing. Just one thing. Just think about whatever that one thing is that you can do better today that you could have done yesterday. That's, very simple, very practical, and very useful. 
This has been great, mate. I really enjoyed uh, being here with you. Thank you for all that you've shared. Um, please tell our audience where they can find out more about you, about uh, how to contact you, all the resources you have, and of course, so that they can find out about your company, Astro Athletica, and all of, all of those resources too. Well, I'm on, you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. My handles are the Brent Hayden, just one word. Or if you want to follow my photography on Instagram or Facebook, it's Brent Hayden Photography. Again, all one word. Um, my website, www.brenthayden.com. And for Astra Athletica, it's just one word on all our social media channels, Astra Athletica, as well as our website, www.astraathletica.com. You can see all of our products and we offer free shipping in North America on all orders over $99. And we're actually having a huge uh, sale right now clearing out the original collection because you know when we go over to Beirut we're going to continue working on our new designs and we got to we got to clear out some room so we can get that new product in fantastic well again this has been a pleasure and honor thank you so much for sharing your time with us Brent and uh, we wish you and, uh, and your bride a wonderful time in Beirut wish you both every possible success while you're there I hope you'll stay with us to the end it has been a joy and a pleasure and again uh, we will make sure that we post uh, in the show notes, those links, but the simple straight link is brenthayden.com. And as I said, we'll post all the other links too. You can hang out with other conscious leaders and chat about this episode or any past episode by simply going to our Facebook page. You just go to Dog Baron Leadership and Loyalty and Podcast. Just find it on Facebook. We're right there. And if you want to find out about hiring me, Dog Baron, as a speaker or strategist for your organization, then come speak, come search us out at fullmontyleadership.com forward slash consulting or fullmontyleadership.com forward slash speaking. The research consistently shows that even the fastest growing companies face the same challenges. They're spending the time, the money, the energy, everything they've got to attract and train and develop their top talent also to have them leave at a just a frustratingly high rate. If you're frustrated with investing in the time and the talent that you need, before you get your ROI, then come talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com, where we provide the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by tapping into purpose. Fullmontyleadership.com, because you can't outsource authenticity. You can also stop by the matrix, matrix.fullmontyleadership.com. That's no triple W's, you don't need that, just matrix like the movie, dot fullmontyleadership.com and get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment tool. It's valued at $197 and it's absolutely free to you for being a regular listener to us. I want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about how you could do something today just a little bit better than yesterday. Remember, it's not about the results. It's about the process. I'm Del Baron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.